Um, really appreciate the, uh, the event, the, the new space activities. I, I think this particular uh, forum has been really uh, an excellent place to go and learn, learn the, uh, the cutting edge of what's happening. And uh, it's a real privilege to, to be a part of it. Um, it's my third year for participation and uh, hope to be here many, many more. Um, with that in mind, um, I wanted to go and provide uh, a little more detail one level down from some of the presentation that you saw earlier today. Um, if we could go to the next chart. I'll go ahead and do that and take care of that. Let's see if that's working. There we go. Okay. I'm going to spend a lot of time with this up on the, uh, the screen. So uh, if folks want to take a picture of it, that's fine. But it really should be out there at some point. Our, our intent, I think, within the agency is to, is to kind of have a common uh, uh, voice about some of the issues and things that we're, we're working on. So um, this will be up there for a while. Um, and what I'm going to talk about is uh, when we say that we're going back to, to, uh, to the moon in a general sense, um, it's, it's worth pointing out, of course, that ever since the lunar, the lunar activities with the Apollo program, that there's been different periods of time where, where there's been a lot of research and development that's been done for different aspects of lunar activities. And um, that has culminated in a lot of uh, things that currently we've been able to grab from, like a larger toolbox. And although it seems like it's cutting edge technologies that are really relevant right now, a lot of it, in many cases, has roots to very fundamental technology development that was done from the 60s all the way till now. Sometimes it was a five year period of time where there was a lot of activity and then there was another five years where it was relatively dormant in that particular part of the, the, the technology portfolio. But long story short, um, it's worth uh, taking a step back at whatever activities you might be doing in industry and seeing whether or not there might be some historical analog where there's some, some uh, long term progress that was made either on, uh, at, at NASA's expense or, or on behalf of the, the taxpayer in general that you might be able to benefit from. And we're, we're certainly happy to, to look into that sort of stuff. Uh, in this case, um, the chart that you're looking at here is a really good uh, one page to start to give you a sense of the, the cloud of technology problems that uh, lunar activities present. Um, I want to use that word just because I'm going to focus on one little sub species of problem that we have, but by no means is it something that should be considered a predominant one. It's just one that perhaps folks can relate to. Um, so this particular chart, which uh, we're going to try to move a little bit here if I can. Let's see. Bear with me. I'm calling an audible. Okay. All right. So um, what we have here is several different types of technology development areas that now, because we have a lunar focus, have a, a, a refreshed relevance. Um, but like I said, by no means is this something where, where NASA's progress in it uh, has, has, hasn't uh, been going for continuously for, for many years. It's just, it might, might be new to you, it might not be new to us in, in many cases. Um, so kind of taking a look at some of this. Um, sooner, uh, if, you, if you take a look over to the, the middle of the chart towards the right here, I even have a laser, don't I? Ooh, okay. So over here on the, on the left-hand set of charts here, surface excavation and construction. The ideas of, of where we're going now are a lot different than Apollo for one reason, and it's worth saying uh, it, it's, it, it drives a lot of different technology changes, but that one reason is that with Apollo, the objective was to get there, and now the objective is to get there and to stay there. And it's the stay there part that really changes a lot of the engineering, which also drives a lot of the technology. There's many different parts of the technology uh, issues that are on this one uh, graphic that point to that sort of stuff. So you end up with new technological challenges that have to do with long-term sorts of activities, autonomous activities, activities where you're relying on some of the machinery to basically, in some cases, kind of set itself up or get things up and running so that there's less risk for when the humans come. You can kind of apply that to a lot of different uh, types of equipment, whether it's, it's the equipment to provide breathable air eventually or to provide propellant so that uh, we can get things back off the surface of the moon. In many of these different cases, you can start to see where, where if some of that equipment can, uh, can be set up, it can be set up such that it can uh, take advantage of this, this sort of autonomy 
then you can, you can go and drive autonomy into a lot of different areas. And so there's some cross-cutting things like that, for example. But that's why it's kind of useful to me to display it as one graphic, because there's a lot of interactivity that might happen. Um, I'm, I'll drill down one little step further just for my own personal subspecies. Uh, as, as the, the, uh, the, uh, the bio says, um, when I was in the, uh, the, the shuttle program, I worked in the main propulsion system for the United Space Alliance as a contractor. And uh, the joke was within the shuttle processing team at Kennedy Space Center that the main propulsion system was, was actually nicknamed the main problem system. But it was something that everybody really appreciated. It was, a, it was a complicated system because it had a lot of different commodities going through it, uh, cryogenic as well as gaseous and, and different sorts of things, lots of critical uh, instrumentation and, and such. But with it being a complicated system, we often had repairs that we had to do, and there was many other subsystems on the shuttle that they would just patiently wait for us to speak up during a scheduling meeting because they knew if they just waited for a second, we'd say, oh, yeah, we've got a two-week delay or something because we've got some replacement we have to do. And then that system, which also had a problem, was off the hook because they could wait. They could wait for us to do an announcement, and they knew they could do their three-day repair or something that they were just about to announce, but they didn't have the bad news. It was the main problem system that had the bad news. So they, were, they kind of appreciated us. Huh? The engineers in the room might kind of under, understand that. Bit. Long story short, uh, the cryogenics. If you look over on the left-hand side, cryofluid management, there's a lot of potential for uh, developing uh, propellants on the surface of the moon from ISRU, in situ resource utilization, where essentially you're taking advantage of the uh, minerals and the, and the content of the regolith, the, the soil that's on the surface of the moon, and converting that into something that you can, you can use to, uh, to, uh, to great economic effect, but also, most importantly, to great logistics effect. If you think about how uh, much less you need to bring up from the surface of the Earth, if you can really start to rely on propellants that start from the surface of the moon, it, it's really an important thing to be thinking about. But the cryofluids are a big part of that because the, the high energy you get, particularly from liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen combinations, is, is, really, a, is really an important enabler for, for a lot of commerce out there. Um, in fact, you don't have to look too far to find examples of industry executives saying in past years that they would be a willing customer for cryo, cryogenically uh, produced fuel or cryogenically stored fuels that came from the surface of the moon because that enables a lot of architecture. Um, so in my case, uh, I could see how my old job of loading the uh, external tank of the shuttle and preparing the main propulsion system for launch starts to have a different sort of form if the spacecraft has to start from the surface of the moon. Well, ideally, you have far fewer people that are actually doing hands-on touching of the, of the ground equipment and it's a lot more automated systems, or ideally it's fully aut automated, something that you could really rely on. Well, that sort of new technology development is, is something that I would suggest has a much stronger importance now in the past six months than I've ever seen in my entire career working in the propulsion. Um, it's fascinating to me. It's, it's, a, it's a collision of, of artificial intelligence and some of the uh, most, uh, most uh, well-regarded subject matter expertise from people who used to, used to be regarded as the, uh, as the wizards figuring out these sort of uh, propulsion systems. So uh, particularly if you can have some sorts of ways where you can, you can do a, a, a better interface between the human and the autonomous systems so that they can kind of rely on each other in a, in a more productive way, even for mission planning or, or, or uh, doing a, a maintenance analysis and things like that, it starts to be very promising. But that's just one particular subspecies. Now, uh, I'm going to take a quick step back, and instead of focusing on that too much, um, I'm going to read a few things that came from the uh, last SBIR STTR solicitation. Now, what that is is our once a year publication that explains all the research topics that we're currently funding through the NASA SBIR STTR program. And uh, I'll leave this up there. I'm just going to read off of some, some notes I have here. But I will say that everything I'm mentioning here is something that is publicly available on the NASA SBIR website. If you just look for the 2019 solicitation, these 19 subtopics, and I'll try to touch on a few of them, are all ones that were focused on the commercial lunar payload services contract uh, activities. So there was 19 that were identified within the SBIR STTR solicitation. You can find that, uh, 
designation within those subtopics if you want to look. It's all publicly available on, on the, the NASA SBR website. Um, so just to give you a sense, of, of the 19 subtopics, a couple of different things that people were, that the, the NASA researchers had identified in, in, the, in the recent year as being uh, relevant for that uh, uh, lunar uh, payload services contract was uh, development of lunar solar surface array structures. Uh, that was topic H501. Uh, in space submodular assemblies. Cryogenic fluid management, which as you know is a subject near and dear to me. Um, payloads for lunar resources, uh, and this one is specific uh, payloads to kind of help identify volatiles or to help search for volatiles. Uh, another one was example, uh, an example of particles and field sensors and instruments enabling technologies. Uh, and they, So these types of titles, I'm just kind of randomly reading, there was 19 total. And to just give you a sense, um, all that, all that is, is areas that uh, NASA has decided in the recent 12 months uh, merit some increased focus. And because of that, we've recently made awards and will probably be, uh, continue to have strong interest in that in the near future. So with that in mind, and I've kind of laid a whole bunch of stuff out there, I'm interested in kind of having more questions that are kind of, again, one level down and more of the, more of the techie kind of questions that people, people are curious. Uh, I think there's microphones out there, and I'll turn the floor over to you guys. What's, anybody have any questions? Any thoughts? Any? Oh, come on. Hey, I did my part. Does the, who's got the microphones? There should be two microphones out there. Anybody even have microphones? Bueller? Oh, there we go. Okay, there's one. Okay. Any questions? Great. Thank you. Do you get the ball rolling here? Uh, this is Steve Bonkowski. I'm from the Kids of Aerospace and Defense Alliance. Uh, this is my fourth year, so I beat you by one. Ah. <laughs> Uh, the uh, presentation that was done uh, this morning on uh, going to the moon uh, with a five-year plan and a ten-year plan. One, and there was an emphasis in that associated with partnerships with uh, uh, commercial as well as taking advantage of, com of independent commercial development. What, what I'm curious about, is there uh, in any kind of plan that's particularly that's 10 years long, mm. I assume there are technologies that need to, need to be developed by particular points in time in order to maintain that schedule. Is that developed for the 10-year period? And is like you're, you have a one year right now for your SBIR, right. and I'm sure that that's an element that goes in there. But is there an, an overall roadmap uh, on how you get there in 10 years with here are the technologies that are needed along the way? We have traditionally in the past had what has literally been called a technology roadmap that's about a five-year cycle, which I think kind of bridges the gap in some ways. Um, I hesitate to say what's, what point that's at in, in terms of, frankly, the developments in the past 12 months have been so fast that um, it might have bits and pieces that are, that are, that are solid, but it, it, it's a bit stale at this point because uh, w there's been so many new, uh, new developments. That being said, uh, the Office of Chief Technologist, which is probably the best uh, uh, group of people to be looking towards for that, uh, had traditionally uh, been the ones who put out that that sort of site or host it, um, so that's um, probably the. I, I would, frankly, from my perspective, it's been these same charts that you've seen today, that um, have been have been pretty con consistently communicated throughout the agency, even down to the to the lower levels, down to the individual technologists. So it's been. Although these are these may seem like simplistic graphics, there's a lot of reasons for for why for why it's being presented in, in a. It's almost more that it's, in my opinion, I would say the agency is really interested in a dialogue, and not so much interested in trying to say we've got it figured out. And and that's it's refreshing to look at it that way, but it's also because, in some ways, we are consistently impressed by what industry has been able to do to where we don't want to undersell what we think you can bring to a partnership. So that's thus the dialogue. So that's that's kind of the point that we're at. Any other questions? 
Guys aren't good at dialogue. Way back in the room, I see one back there, and there's one in the middle maybe somewhere. Boy. My sandwich is right there. Actually, I got a glass of water. I'll be right back. Because if you don't say something, I'm just going to start to read off some more of these areas. And sooner or later, it'll be like, bingo, and somebody go, oh, wait, that's the thing. Right uh, in the back hi. of the room, please. We'll start there. Yes. Hi. Uh, so my question is... Uh, can, you, can you introduce yourself, please? Uh, my name is Poonam uh, Josen, and uh, I'm interested in the bioastronautics aspect of human space flex exploration. Okay. So my question is regarding these technologies, mm -hmm. uh, and specifically surface-based technologies. Uh, are there any efforts uh, in different NASA centers where they are doing like, you know, like dedicated testing on Earth before you know you send them off in space? Ah, okay. Uh, for mm -hmm. example, we've had desert rats and those kind of programs in the past, and they have been on and off. Uh, so, is there anything going on in particular in that direction? You know, if I have one question in the room earlier today, I thought I saw Harry Partridge. Is Harry anywhere in there? Did you see Harry? Did he just go out? Okay. Well, then I'm going to put words in his mouth. <laughs> no. Um, it, I was just deferring to him because he might actually have a really good perspective on on that. I I would say one thing that that I I would emphasize. Although I'm talking about this, and this is kind of the hot topic, this sort of stuff. Um, there's a lot of different areas that we do tech development that we've always had some pretty consistent momentum. And particularly when it has to do with what I would call human in the loop sort of closed systems, that's something that has, especially in the last five or six years, I think we've had some really nice ramping up of, of activities because across everything we're working on, that just saves so much effort. I mean, it, it has to do with reduced logistics. It, everything across, the, across everybody's portfolio gets so much better if you can put less resources into just getting there or if you can put more capabilities into the same amount of pounds of mass. It's either way, it, you know, it just gets a lot easier. You get more robust. You have more, more capability. So there's, there's interest from that perspective. The reason there's such a focus on this is it's almost like this has got a quick start right now compared to some things where it's been a continuous sort of emphasis uh, in, in this sort of uh, environment. I, I, Although I'm pointing out 19 of the subtopics of that solicitation, I think we was over 109, 110 something subtopics that were in the total solicitation. So this is only a, you know 20 percent of the of the total portfolio from that perspective. Um, so uh, other questions? There's another question over there. Great. Hey Mike. Um, so th this might be a question that you might not be able to answer. Some of my colleagues just left who I was going to pertain to. Uh, they built, they're building small modular reactors, fusion, uh, fission reactors, uh, using the new Triso fuels, Ultra Safe Nuclear Corporation. I've been looking at their technology for a few years now, um, and they've got some great announcements about to come up. Mm -hmm. If we put a five megawatt reactor on the moon, yeah. it totally changes the whole conversation about everything that we do on the moon. Where's NASA involved? Where, where's NASA on the idea of uh, nuclear? Um, uh, uh, fission power on the moon's surface or, or beyond. Okay, let me see if I can get you a real specific answer on that because although it's not my area Well, okay. So, I was hoping I could give you a quick bit of information in terms of what we've been looking at, research topics for that from the last 2019. And, and we do have a subtopic for nuclear thermal propulsion. Maybe we've got another one down in there somewhere. Um, or if other NASAs are in the room and like to speak to that subject, um, it's not exactly launch related, or I could wing it. Um, I, I think, from what I understand, though, we, we do have some activities that are going on in that direction. And the, I would suggest in this environment, if you've had any kind of intermittent uh, discussions with 
NASA representatives or NASA subject matter experts who, who have had some kind of dialogue like that in the past, it's a great time to get reacquainted and to be, and to be discussing what you see as an obvious solution for some of the larger technological challenges we have. Now, the way I'm trying to say that is I don't want to try to act like I know for sure what NASA's long-term plan is with regards to what forms of power sources, but I would know that as, a lar as an engineer trying to help design the larger system, I would sure want to know all the different tools that are in the toolbox, you know, just for, for what the different hypotheticals are and what the trade-offs are. So, um, again, if, if the, the different folks that, that might have had some, and uh, this is something I alluded to uh, earlier, and I'll, I'll try to say it in another way. Um, a lot of times we are trying to make sure that we're responsive to, to the different changes in the agency direction, and sometimes that ends up making it to where we have intermittent progress on some subject areas. And it's a shame because we put a lot of effort into funding the development of some of these technologies. And, and in many ways, for me, the SBIR program, what we do is we help develop new niches in the industry that we know the agency's going to need down the road. So it's great when we can have a steady, reliable, consistent ramp up of activities so, it's, it's so people can can help provide a, a flourishing set of options and things that are off the shelf. And, and, but when we have situations where the agency direction changes, of course, then sometimes you get kind of a stuttering effect. But uh, that being said, um, if you have some, some past history where you, you, you've worked on some things that are, that are relevant to this or had some thoughts about it, I think you'd find that, that most of the NASA subject matter experts that you've worked in the past would probably be curious to, to hear your new thoughts, if that helps. Other questions? I want to take a, just steer things Please. just slightly. Please. Uh, instead of the technology, I want to talk about the business application. So, and again, my lens for any of this is the entrepreneur who has to make payroll. Uh, so for some of the folks that are in the audience that maybe haven't gone through the SBIR process, uh, can you talk a little bit about some of the challenges that exist with NASA between, as you just said, like changes in what you're focused on and the cycle that you currently run on, right. as opposed to the fruit fly life of a small startup where, you know, three months later we're doing something completely different than we did before. Okay. So, and I know there is work that's going on in that topic, but yeah, could you yeah. speak to I, that a little bit? I'll, 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 give a, I'll give a more like everything's great optimist way of looking at it. Here, here's where it works really well to get involved in the SBIR program, and here's where it might not work kind of well, just, just as a summary. The reason I'm saying that is we actually have more of a detailed ability to talk to folks about the SBIR program this afternoon, so I'm not going to kill folks who have already seen that sort of stuff. But I think what you're getting at is when does it work for a startup, when does it not work? Um, in my opinion, where it's really worked uh, is – when you have an environment where somebody has developed some kind of expertise in a particular area, and although the, the, they may have a secure kind of job or situation that they, they've sort of been wanting to launch out into that, we are literally called America's Seed Fund, the SBIR program over the federal government. And NASA is actually only one of 11 federal agencies that are doing it. So the whole point of that is that when there is a situation where a company can spring up and come into existence to kind of support this technology development in, in a given area, it's, 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 a, uh, it's a good opportunity for that particular company. Now, so if someone is applying yeah. and they are currently a, they are employed by someone else and they, they make the commitment that they'll, because the PI has to have 50% or 30%, there's some minimum requirement. Um, is that a positive evaluation criteria if they're looking at starting a company or a negative or not a factor at all? I, I, I'm from my own opinion, I'm going to answer that one, but then if you really want more questions like that, you've got to come to the afternoon thing, all right? Good. Nice one. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm happy to say that, that we've had plenty of examples across the whole spectrum where it's been situations where you have somebody who might have been comfortably working for some supply contractor sort of thing to a DOD something or other, and they had an idea for a new type of sensor, and it ended up really uh, causing a great paradigm shift for what we could do for evaluating a new planet. You know, that sort of thing, and I'm just being general, general, that sort of stuff has happened. Where it doesn't work, where it doesn't work is when somebody thinks that they can put their entire business plan onto the SBIR critical path. And what I'm trying to get at is, 
SBIR is really good, but it, in many ways it's, it's a slow uh, process to where it might not be fast enough for you to be responsive to the business world. I, in my own opinion, uh, I think it works really well when you already have some sort of commercial activity as a tech startup of some sort and you've got some viability and you have an opportunity to kind of expand and throw some proposals out and see if you can kind of complement that portfolio. Then you've got some sort of viability, and this is kind of helps you launch into saying government contracting is, is a potential pathway for you in the future. And just in case you're not aware, $125,000 sounds like a lot of money if it's in your bank account, but it is not a lot of money to develop space stuff. Uh, we'll throw it over there. Just one other quick thing. As you're talking about developing a technology and coming out of another company, please be very careful to understand your employment agreement before you take that great idea out and spin it out to create your own company because your employer may or may not think that that is conflicting with what they do. All good points. Is so, there questions? Um, is there a microphone over there? Yeah. Oh, sorry, I think there's one in the middle. Raphael Spears, great. Aerospace Corporation. I see up in the top right of your slide, you've got electric propulsion. Mm -hmm. And I'm aware of, you know, NASA's going back years development of EP for Discovery and New Frontiers mission. Is your intent or is there the intent now that you have this specific Moon to Mars um, initiative to continue to evolve those systems, those EP systems for this application or are you intending to open it up to the commercial marketplace that's also been developing EP alongside of some of NASA's EP development? I honestly am under the impression that it's been a lot of collaboration leading up to this point to get to where we all uh, are in that, in that whole subject as is. Uh, you you kind of make it sound like it's an either or sort of, sort of thing. Uh, well, there, there are different requirements. If you go into deep space, mm. from the device standpoint, you know, there's different ISP and thrust requirements versus if you're going to the gateway or to the moon. So, so is your question about whether NASA's R&D resources with regards to electric propulsion are focused on deep space type applications versus more commercially uh, uh, supportive applications? No, more. I know there have been focus on deep space. Is there an intent to pivot that to this type of activity in terms of requirements? Or are you mm -hmm. going to just put requirements out to the commercial marketplace and let them bring the technology? My instinct is the latter, because if you look at what happened with the gateway procurement, um, I was actually uh, at uh, Florida Institute of Technology when, when uh, Bridenstine was able to make the announcement of the, the subcontractor selection for that. And I think, I think that the people sort of missed the punchline on that whole thing, which it wasn't so much that, they, that the decision was made for that specific company, it was the procurement cycle had been abruptly altered and there was a very responsive issuing of a contract as far as that was concerned. So I think if you kind of look at some of the major areas of the, of the technology portfolio where some significant R&D is going to have to go in, you're probably going to see a, a lot more forward leaning into, into taking advantage of what industry can do to accelerate this stuff and a lot less of us trying to figure out how to ramp up things internally because I, I think it's all hands on deck to, from my perspective. There was a question from someone at this table about how do you explain when you're writing an SBIR, should you explain how physics work or should you assume that the reviewer already knows everything? Uh, okay, I'll give you one punchline because this is a very educated audience. I'll give you one tip here, but again, you've got to go to the afternoon. Because mostly it's because a lot of folks have heard this stuff a lot of times, and, and I'm just sorry. I could explain the phase one and phase two again and again. You guys have heard it. But for, for the folks that haven't seen it, the biggest thing I, I, that I think I've heard as a really relevant aha from the system engineer perspective or from the engineering perspective uh, in terms of a proposal, what's really important for tech development and how it comes through in an SBIR proposal or STTR is where are the benefits from the system engineer perspective of the innovation you're talking about, okay? And I'll just throw as a rough example, kind of what I'm getting about from the system perspective. Say, say that you're really talking about an automated rover that goes across the surface of the moon. And your technology is that you've got some kind of improved 
motor that can drive the wheels and save it and it can go 10 times as efficient as any kind of electrical device or whatever. That's all great that you're explaining that it's unobtainium device, wound magnets, whatever, whatever, that, that's great. But what you really need to lead with in a proposal is if you're developing rovers, this type of thing can go and save this much more, can give you this much more range. For example, the last, the last NASA rover that we all know about was X. If X had this, then X could go X plus this. It's being described at the systems engineer's perspective. This is the benefits. That's probably a good mid-level place of detail to try to explain why it's an innovation to where the people that are doing the technology can evaluate and say, yeah, he's right from that perspective. If you say it that way, yeah, he's right. You know? But it's also high, enough, high up enough so that somebody who's got program money, like a program manager, who's got about 20 minutes to decide, hey, we've got, a, we've got 20 million that's left over this fiscal year. Is there some, some technology that we can go use? Quick decisions getting made. If they hear it from their perspective, it's like, yeah, that makes sense. Okay, that, 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 that's in alignment. Let's do it. Both, both sides of NASA are an important stakeholder in the eventual use of that technology. So that describing it at that level, at the system engineer's perspective, is maybe a, a good way of starting. And I would suggest that just even if it's hardware or software, just for what it's worth. Anyway, take that little nugget. Other questions? And if somebody, like, yank me off the stage if you want. I have no concept of time. Okay, after, after that one, we'll, we'll go to you next. Hi, I'm McKenna Davis. I'm a graduate student at UCLA, and I work in EP, so I'm excited to see electric propulsion uh, represented, prioritized. Knowing that uh, all propulsion thus far in history has been dominated by chemical propulsion, is there an interest in bimodal thrusters that can capitalize on our heritage technology along with EP? I think there is a real interest in everything we can do other than chemical, because everybody wants to get away from... from I wouldn't say get away from. It's more like we all have the suspicion that there's a lot more robust and better, more efficient ways of doing things. So even if there's some more exotic ideas out there, it's been refreshing to see that there's more and more language in subtopics that kind of open a door for that sort of thing. Um, also, uh, one little thing, I just want to make a plug to some sister agencies too, the Missile Defense Agency and some other different things, DOD-wise, have some interest in some of these things too that... I, understandably, uh, there's different different uh, parts of the space industry, but there's probably on any on any given subject, you'd, you'd find about three or four government agencies overlapping that might be interested in the conversation. So it might help to broaden your horizons. Questions? Yeah. Hey. Thank you. Um, so I had a, a little bit of a techie question: yeah. is how you started here, and it's based on what you're working with on cryofield management on sure. the moon eventually. So I'm just curious, because I'm outside of the process with respect to NASA and contractors and how that works. Mm -hmm. So if someone was, how, does it, how do you go about basically NASA going about saying, we want to build a cryofield management uh, system on the moon? Do you basically write the specs yourself? Do you go to someone that basically has the knowledge uh, that has worked with NASA in the past? Do you basically, do you uh, uh, go out to regular companies or contractors like Floor Daniel Liquid Air. I'm just a little bit curious, just being outside of the whole process yeah, here. It, Thanks. I, I would say it's easy to describe how it used to be, and it's nice to be able to describe how it's, it's changed. Um, it used to be kind of a, a top-down sort of thing. Uh, a lot of times, at least that was kind of my feeling uh, working through the shuttle program and, and immediately after, where we sort of we were looking for the elegant architecture, and because we made all these specific assumptions all over the place, we had really specific requirements. And although the suppliers of those particular components might not understand why we're looking for these specific things, it might be because there's some other things over there. We just haven't communicated those to those persons. So it would see kind of obscure to a particular supplier why they won't need this requirement, or why, why they not need that type of fabric insulation when it's easier to do this or whatever. You know, it might be a fire resistance thing or something. Who knows? Long story short, um, we might not have been that good at communicating things, mostly because we didn't start with a dialogue. We kind of started top down. Um, I think what I've seen in the last two or three years has been several different categories of solicitation that have popped up, for example, like uh, ACO, Announcement of Collaborative Opportunities, or different things like that, where we have categories of solicitation where the whole process starts with somebody in industry going, you know, if NASA just helped me do this, 
then we'd be able to do that. And that's a whole different way of even you know, starting a conversation. So there's, there's ways that, that the dialogue's different. And I don't think you're going to see, you'll probably see a pleasant blend of where the, the different ideas came from when you look at a total operation that's up and running like, like this sort of graphic. Other thoughts? How are we on time? No? Just real quick, I guess if, if they have questions, I'm sure they're going to come see you this afternoon. Um, and yeah, I, I'm missed... fucking out of here, man. <laughs> <laughs> um, did, did you mention uh, already the uh, innovation conference that's coming up in Aurora? Oh, that's a great one. Can you please, I, I don't have the yeah. information from you. Can I, you I had to cheat and pull it up myself. Uh, opportunity conf, uh, innovation and Opportunity Conference being held in Aurora, Colorado, November 14th and 15th. Um, I think this is the second year they've done it. Um, the SBI, NASA SBIR program had a large presence there, not only kind of talking technology, but also the contract management folks were there. Um, it was a great event. So that, um, that's like that's like SBIR con for NASA is that particular sorry that particular event. Yeah, that's right. um, the industry opportunity conference is, is our so we've been doing it two years in a row where it's kind of a joint thing with a couple other events, but it's really been three or four years in a row that we've basically had an industry day for the SBIR STTR program. So it, it was in Ames for a couple years in a row prior, and we were able to bring NASA subject matter experts from all the different centers on site and have them do presentations and have them basically explain, hey, here's the technical things we're working on where we've got some unresolved issues and, and here's our challenges. And uh, it ended up being a, a really fruitful place to have a lot of dialogue back and forth. It's also a great place to really get into the nuts and bolts of real specifics or if there's contract issues. Like REI, who's the, uh, the uh, agency-wide contractor for SBIR, the support test, the help people, they've got a presence there the entire time so that things can get resolved real time. And, and, and if you don't walk out with answers, then, then we really want to hear about it because we've got everybody there. So that, that's that type of event. It's in Colorado, and can you say the date again? Uh, it is November 14th and 15th, I oh. believe. So if and you're we're at? If, uh, in Aurora, Colorado, and if so you it, like it, how I, I encourage I, that dialogue, I do. Cool? That's awesome. Uh, and, and if you have family that has decided to come into town for Thanksgiving for the entire month of November, you now have a way to escape. Uh, one last question before we go. You've got all these folks here. Um, what can we do for you to help? you accomplish the objectives you're trying to get. Okay, well, quick question. Show of hands, who has tried to propose to the NASA SBIR program as CTR? Quick, anybody, show of hands, couple? Okay, did all you guys know that we've been asking for uh, information and feedback about what you felt for the solicitation? We're very interested in hearing back, so if you've submitted to the process, we wanna hear about how you felt about the process, but we also wanna hear back some, of the, some more of the ideas and, and, and different thoughts about what subtopics should have uh, uh, in terms of uh, in, what we, what the, the big thing we're trying to make sure we understand is, is if, if some new uh, capabilities have happened in a particular area, make sure that, that the dialogue has been there so that we can take advantage and leverage uh, what the new, the, the new capabilities that NASA can apply from their perspective as well. So we we want to have that dialogue and make sure we're up to, up to speed with the, with the cutting edge and just about everything we're working on. So we appreciate it. Um, it's like a lot of you got to be in it to win it. Absolutely. So. Thank you very much. Really and appreciate thank it. Thank you.